Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Skogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations, and your host for Webinar Wednesday. AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connections of resources and partners along the value chain and increase knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Today's webinar Wednesday is supported by AURI's valued partner, Predictive Search. Predictive Search combines innovative executive and professional search methods with proprietary assessment tools, predictive analytics, and digital delivery with curated video vignettes. Predictive Search measures personality, competency, cognitive ability, experience, and culture fit measures configured to your organization. Experience the state of the art and science of search with Predictive Search. Remember this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Also remember, you will be muted during our presentations today, but that you can send us your written questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Well, the COVID pandemic put the spotlight on small meat processing and slaughter operations that bridge the gap between the local farmer and consumer. Training options for butchers has also declined while the existing skilled workers are aging out of the industry. Today, we will learn about new educational and technical opportunities for meat processing and slaughter. And AURI will also share some information about a mobile meat slaughtering grant opportunity that we are administrating for the state of Minnesota. We'll begin with an AURI perspective from Michael Sparby. Michael is the commercialization director of AURI. He's responsible for developing projects, securing grant funds, assisting in the program delivery, oversees the annual AURI stakeholder analysis process, and is responsible for AURI's Cooperative Development Center through USDA's Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program. Joining Michael today will be Keith Olander, Dave Endicott, and Jeff Miller. Keith Olander is the Director of Ag Centric in the Central Lakes College Ag and Energy Center. He's been in agriculture education for more than 25 years and has a bachelor's degree and master of education degree in agricultural teacher education from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. He and his family live in rural Staples, Minnesota, where they operate a 350-acre crop farm and grow mostly corn and soybeans. Dave Endicott is the Dean of Staples Campuses, Staples CTE, Nursing and Grants at Central Lakes College. He enters his second year in this role after serving 27 years in the K-12 education world as a teacher, a coach, principal, and superintendent. One of his responsibilities this past year has been to explore and develop a meat cutting and butchery program for CLC to meet the needs of the industry in meat production. And today we'll also hear from Jeff Miller. Jeff is the Dean of Instruction for Technical Programs at Ridgewater College. He works with program areas in agriculture, construction, and human services. He's been with Ridgewater College since November of 2019. Jeff has been with Minnesota State since 2007, serving as a faculty member, academic director, statewide career pathway director, and now academic dean. Jeff has specialized in the development of academic program areas and all career clusters in both credit and non-credit formats. So let's get started. Michael Sparby, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thank you, Dan. Uh, again, my name is Michael Sparby with AURI, and I'm going to cover AURI's meat industry activities, uh, covering the areas of AURI's past, current, and ongoing support of the meat industry, our new cooperative agreement with USDA Ag Marketing Services to support regional meat industry, and Minnesota's legislative support for AURI's meat industry efforts. Next. AURI has over 30 years experience supporting Minnesota's meat industry through direct client services such as product development, co-product development, and business development services. We also collaborate with our partners for public domain research. 
An example of that would be the Halal Kosher Minnesota Meat Market Assessment, which was supported by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and conducted by the University of Minnesota's Regional Development Partnership and is also located on our website. We have also had a number of food safety interventions for small meat processors. Those are classes and videos that are also located on our website. And over the years, we have had several surveys of the meat industry to highlight areas of opportunity and gaps. Next. We've just entered into a cooperative agreement with USDA's Ag Marketing Service to support the regional meat industry. And this is a two-year agreement to provide regional support for the industry through direct technical assistance to processors, regional needs assessment for the industry, regional resource mapping for the industry, and a regional assessment of financial support for meat processing processing startups and expansion activities. And when we say regional, we're talking multi-state. Next. The Minnesota legislature, the last session, provided $150,000 for two years to support the hiring of a meat innovation specialist. And we are currently in the process of, of hiring that position. And they also provided $500,000 of matching grant funds to organizations to acquire, host, and operate a mobile meat slaughter unit. Next. Some more details about the mobile meat slaughter grant request for proposal. The, uh, the mobile meat slaughter unit shall coordinate with Minnesota state two-year colleges that have meat cutting programs to accommodate education and training as it relates to meat slaughter and processing. The mobile unit may coordinate with livestock producers who desire to provide value-added meat products by utilizing the meat slaughter unit. And the mobile unit may also be used for research training outside of the two-year college system and other activities that align with industry needs. The maximum award is $500,000. The matching dollar requirements are applicants must provide a minimum of one-to-one -one cash match for every dollar or grant dollar requested through this program. Acceptable matching fund sources include private, federal, state of Minnesota colleges or university funds. And the proposals are due at 4.30 p.m. Central Time on October 22nd. Further information can be downloaded uh, for this request for proposal at auri.org. And in the search field, just type in mobile unit and it'll pop right up. Now I'll hand it over to Keith. Thank you, Michael. As mentioned earlier by Dan, Keith Olander is my name, Executive Director for AgCentric. Uh, today marks for me really a lot of excitement and I wanna just come on and share very briefly just where we've come in the process. For those of you not familiar with AgCentric, we are connected within the folks of education and industry. And so as you'll see today, we've looked at uh, in the industry demands that came out of COVID as Dan alluded to and where AURI is moving, but on the other side, where are the education components to this to really be a, a solutions orientated approach? Um, certainly not going to cover everything, but this idea and to share how do we bring about talent right to fill this pipeline and the, the needs that are out there uh, for that. And so as we talk about the mobile slaughter unit, I'm excited to see that come forward and we were a catalyst in trying to support that effort. And now we're going to hear from Dave and Jeff in terms of what's happening on the education side to really start to bring about talent. I also wanted to share going forward, we're currently working on a couple of federal pieces, both in the earmark process and in the grant process to really augment not just what the colleges are going, but how do we connect with industry further? So if you have interest in that and want to reach out, I uh, just encourage you to do so. Again, Keith Olander through Agcentric, but happy to support through the Minnesota State System as a Center of Excellence in Agriculture. So with that, Dave, if you would take it from here and share what Central East College is doing at your campus. Thank you, Keith. 
So my name is Dave Endicott. I'm the Dean of, uh, as was mentioned before, I'm the Dean of uh, Career Tech Programs here on the Staples campus, which is where our meat cutting and butchery program will be housed. Uh, next, please. Some of the background, uh, when I was brought on a little over a year ago, I was asked to explore, continuing the exploration uh, into a meat cutting program to see uh, what the need was. What has been proven beyond the shadow of a doubt is the need is significant, both in the ag side and the retail side. We know that livestock producers are experiencing a shortage of processing, especially on the slaughter end, uh, being able to get them to slaughter in a timely fashion uh, has become very key. Uh, retail markets are experiencing a shortage of workforce to meet those needs. We've talked to the grocers unions uh, and the same needs that we find in the ag site are also in those retail markets as well. Um, workforce is a key challenge in a lot of areas, but certainly in the, for processors. Um, slaughter should be a part of any workforce training program we've discovered. Initially, we were not talking about slaughter, and that's why we're excited about the possibility of a mobile slaughter unit that we could use uh, for two or three weeks a year to train our students uh, so that they would have the ability to go in and start from slaughter and really go from farm to table in their training and within our program. Uh, there's, there's a strong precedent for mobile slaughter. We've seen that throughout the country. We've had that in our own state through some programs here. As of my last search I have done, and Jeff maybe has some new information, but last I saw there were seven training programs and I'm talking about within the college levels. Uh, sometimes there are the large meat producers will do their own training, but in the college levels, there's seven training programs in North America. And I actually think one of those maybe is shutting down. So we might be down to six without the creation of these programs at Ridgewater and CLC. We certainly had an issue before COVID. COVID has exacerbated that need for trained workforce and we need more outlets for butchery and meat cutting. So we need people to help with slaughter. We also need people to move in. A lot of our butchers that are working are nearing retirement age. We know there's already a need for that workforce. We need to find a way to develop that workforce. And we really believe our colleges are a key component of developing that. Our region in particular has significant slaughter and processing, making this a logical place for us in Staples and down in Ridgewater to develop and grow a program. Next, please. The program we are proposing and putting together is a 16 credit one semester certificate program. There would be courses in meat cutting, value added processing, food safety and sanitation, meat industry communication, meet merchandising and marketing and an internship with an entrepreneurship capstone approach to it. Um, we're hoping that through this curriculum, we'll be able to give a glimpse at least and some experience in the farm to table processes in meat cutting and butchery. Uh, we also are fortunate at CLC, we have a certified kitchen. Uh, we have a culinary program that we are getting on, hoping to get off the ground as well and hoping to connect these two pieces together to provide us the opportunity for our students to experience really the full gamut uh, within the meat cutting industry and within the, the meat market as, as it exists today. Next, please. So what will you get as a student in the meat cutting program at CLC? You'll have the opportunity to learn about farm practices, Keith has been a part of, uh, we, have, we are fortunate, we have a 2000 acre research farm across the street from our main campus. Uh, we're hoping to incorporate some of these things into uh, that farm. We also are starting an agronomy program next year and hopefully we can continue to build the ag side of it up here. Uh, learn about farm practices in the class, get out on local farms. We've got a lot of good partners that have offered us the opportunity to provide our students training. Uh, let them explore livestock terminology, selection, and care. Uh, apply that pasture to plate philosophy, as well as manage all the aspects of a retail butcher shop, getting them experiences within those retail butchers. In the butcher shop, you're going to be able to identify and inspect and process carcasses, as well as they'll be able to prepare and package meat for sale. And then learning about interactions with customers and how to do customer service. Professionally, they're going to learn about meat cutting, trimming, boning, breaking, wrapping, the rest of it that you can see there. Uh, we're, we're hoping to give them uh, as much as possible, the hands-on experiences, uh, it's, that hands-on piece is gonna be really key to all of this. The other piece of this that's really in, in vital for us is designing menus, determining the ingredients, and then that serves safe credential, making sure that they understand the safety needs that are gonna need to be met. Next, please, thank you. What are the career opportunities? There are a number, but these are just a few that could possibly 
that this training could provide them for butcher apprentices, uh, food science technicians, food safety specialists, uh, meat carvers, state and federal meat inspectors, meat market manager, retail wholesale meat processors and cutters that could be business owners and then harvest floor employees at those different plants that are butchering. Next, please. So what are our needs in order for this program to happen? One is the infrastructure. We're gonna need refrigeration, rails and racks and storage space. What we're really looking at, and, and we're excited about the possibility of the funding can come through is modular units that would provide our students the really state-of-the-art training and processing facilities to work within. And with the mobile slaughter that has been discussed before, that mobile slaughter unit would hook directly up into these modular units so that we could easily transport halves and quarters from that slaughter unit into the modular units for our students to be doing their training and get that hands-on experience in, in a very high-tech way. Uh, if we aren't able to do those modular units, we do have a plan to do the training within our kitchen and we're gonna need this processing equipment either way. So a saw, a boning table, grinder, scales, patty machine, stuffer, smoker, slicer. The most important need, and I've highlighted that, is students. We know the need for workforce is significant. We know that we're a key component to helping build that, but we need to make sure that we have students to fill that. And so we're gonna need our partners and we have been really just fortunate to have a great number of partners with AURI, Minnesota Farmers Union, Minnesota Department of Ag, and any number of other agricultural uh, entities that see the need and want to support this program, as well as the program at Ridgewater. We also know that we've had great conversations with uh, the, the union for the um, grocers union so that they can also look at potentially having maybe a Cub Foods that would provide scholarships and then also internships and perhaps jobs down the road for students that are interested in entering into this field. Uh, but that's gonna be a key component for us over the next few months as we look at a next, uh, starting our program next fall, fall of 22 uh, in August, we'll be beginning our meat cutting and butchery program. Next, please. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Miller uh, from the Dean of Instruction at Ridgewater. Thanks, Dave. As uh, Dave mentioned, my name is Jeff Miller. I'm currently serving as the Dean of Instruction for Technical Programs at Ridgewater, and I oversee our uh, programs that deal in agriculture. So just a little background about Ridgewater College. Like Central Lakes and Ag Centric, we are a member of Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Uh, we have two campuses, one in, in Wilmer and one in Hutchinson. We serve roughly 4,700 students. Uh, we are extremely proud of our agriculture programs here at Ridgewater College. Uh, we, we boast the, the largest egg program in terms of uh, student numbers. Uh, we currently have nine agriculture program offerings, which includes the longest running custom applicator program in the nation, the third longest running precision egg program in the nation, the only dairy management program in the state, and the only poultry management uh, program in the state. Next slide, please. So as Dave mentioned, uh, Ridgewater College has been exploring this opportunity, um, you know, for, for almost a year in terms of um, how can we meet workforce demand and uh, workforce development in the uh, meat cutting industry. So <clears throat> we're currently in the developmental phase. And when I say that, um, I... I almost call it the developmental phase until we are ready to um, enroll students in our program. And like Central Lakes program, Ridgewater College, we expect uh, fall of 22 start. We've been working um, through the advisory committee process with a whole host of, of great uh, committed uh, organizations and individuals um, that, that help us build our curriculum, um, help us make programmatic decisions, um, how we're going to pull this off. So um, on our on our advisory committee, you know, we have we have local meat cutters, we have uh, local and regional locker plants, um, individual butchers, uh, some state agencies, the Research Institute, many trade organizations, um, corporate and private uh, enterprises, and large to uh, mid to small uh, uh, butcher shops, locker plants, local, regional. So we're extremely fortunate to have the 
uh, engagement from our local uh, workforce um, because without their support, it, it, would, it would be hard for us to, to uh, build a, a program in, in meat cutting. So uh, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to work with a group of people that are so committed. So next slide, please. So um, Ridgewater College uh, program is, is a little bit different in terms of uh, structure than what, what Dave talked about at Central Lakes. So um, similar to Central Lakes, <clears throat> we are gonna offer a certificate uh, somewhere between 16 and 18 credits. I, I think we're pretty close to, to landing on, on uh, 18 credits. The certificates are going to be stackable in nature, so uh, a student can uh, complete one, two, or three certificates to stack into a, a diploma. Um, our um, idea is that the incumbent worker or the or the new student could enter the program at, at any phase in their career. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. We have a strong belief at Ridgewater that <clears throat> offering flexible delivery for our program is going to be the way that we're going to attract students. So for example, um, a couple evenings a week and maybe one weekend a month or something like that, um, the student would, would engage with the coursework um, through the hybrid delivery method where uh, maybe some of the some of the lecture components are are delivered remotely or online, and the, and the hands-on portion is uh, conducted face to face. Um, and and there obviously has to be a strong component to uh, to the labs and the hands-on experience. So we're we're extremely excited about the opportunity to get to get our students uh, into uh, into a facility and and have them start start working with uh, the meat. Um, we're also exploring options for uh, for an earn and earn as you learn opportunity through the apprenticeship model and uh, partnering with our K-12 partners for a dual enrollment um, situation. Next slide, please. So this slide is, is very busy and I apologize for that, but this will, I think, give you some idea on how our <clears throat> meat cutting uh, certificates will stack. So the the student um, could enter at any phase in, in one of these certificates. So for example, if there's a, a person that has no experience in, in butchering or, or meat cutting, they, they could enter at certificate one, get the basic fundamentals in the, in the tool usage, the HACCP training, food safety, uh, the, the slaughtering process. Um, this first certificate will uh, focus on, on some more of the, the traditional species of, of beef, swine, and poultry. Um, the, the idea is that they could complete this in one semester um, and, and we would offer it in, in either a short course form or flexible delivery format. Um, ideally, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to think about how we can market this program to students. So it's a great opportunity for somebody that uh, has, has no skills or um, is, is excited about the career field but, but have, hasn't had a chance to enter, so, so the entry-level worker. This also is a good opportunity maybe for the hobby or the enthusiast, the person that just wants to uh, take a course or two in, in learning how to how to cut meat for themselves or or some other uh, uh, person. Um, this is also a good opportunity for that incumbent worker to uh, really enter into the into the career and and put some education behind their experience. And then we're going to offer a second certificate, which is in more of the advanced meat processing. Uh, techniques and so you know some of the some of the sausage and the smoking and curing areas, um, and then including uh, some of the advanced species of of maybe bison, elk, and and uh, game processing. This is designed so that a person can enter. Um, 
that that's an incumbent worker that that's looking to upskill. Maybe they're not getting the advanced training at their job, and uh, they they want to they want an option to learn some more uh, skills. Uh, they can enter right at certificate two, and then we feel that there's enough um, opportunity for the meat cutting entrepreneur, which is the uh, certificate three, again, 16 to 18 credits. Um, they'll get some uh, strictly business related kinds of, of content in how to develop a marketing plan, um, human resource training, building capital, those kinds of skills. And then, and then a significant portion of this <clears throat> certificate will be in regulatory compliance and being able to meet, meet standards through uh, Minnesota Department of Ag, USDA, those kinds of things like that. This uh, would be uh, a certificate that would be established for somebody to enter that that would be maybe in the uh, that that's already skilled in butchering and and meat processing. They have the opportunity to take over uh, a butcher shop or a, a plant or a, you know some other. Uh, business endeavor. Um, and then uh, this might be the, the great opportunity for somebody that wants to do the, the direct marketing. Um, they, they can learn the, the business related skills. So, so once you stack all three of these certificates together, uh, the student would earn a, a diploma. Um, and and that might be an attractive option for our students. And as Dave uh, mentioned earlier in his presentation, um, all of this is is great opportunity for for us. Our our fear, I think, is that uh, we, you know, where do we find the students? And so um, we're really excited for the opportunity at Ridgewater to to do offer this program, and and uh, hopefully we'll find some uh, some students that are also interested. So slide. And that's all for my portion of the presentation and I'll turn it back over to Dan. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, this is your opportunity now to ask the experts the questions. And uh, I'll, I'm, the first one's gonna be directed to uh, Jeff and uh, Dave uh, because there is a question about the actual start of the program. And I think you both mentioned your potential or your planned startup times, but uh, if you would both uh, reiterate once again, when you plan to start uh, taking uh, recruiting students and when you plan to start your first classes. Sure, thanks, Dan. So um, officially, uh, our intention is to begin recruiting students uh, as soon as possible. So um, on the Ridgewater College website, we have a, a coming soon page where uh, a person can fill out a form. And once our program's approved and we're taking ap actual applications, uh, uh, prospective students will be notified and then we can start the registration process. Um, we plan at Ridgewater College to kick off our first cohort of students starting fall of 22, which is, you know, on or around that August 24th timeframe and will run through um, December 15th approximately of, of 22. Very similar, yeah, very similar story for us. We'll be starting in fall of 22. We are currently, the curriculum has been submitted to our academic committee for approval this week. Uh, and as soon as we get all of those approvals done through our system, uh, we'll be putting that up for folks to register for and, and get uh, also get faculty member hired because that's gonna be really important for students to be able to visit with those faculty members. Uh, so that's going to be happening over the next uh, time frame is a little bit fuzzy, but over the next couple of months, a few months, we'll get all those pieces together and have that available. But then it will be, we will be starting in August of 22, barring any collapse of that process. So somebody watching today says, I've heard of people doing on farm slaughter, then taking the carcass back to a facility to complete processing. How is that different from a traditional meat processor model where animals are brought live to a plant, slaughtered and processed there? What are the licensing differences? Does anybody have the answer to that one? 
I'm not sure this will answer all of it, but the modules we are looking at doing the processing in will be USDA certified. So they'll be able to do that processing within these modules and be able to sell it really anywhere across state lines or uh, as uh, you know, within the stores, whatever that works as. Um, but beyond that, I'm not an expert on that. And and the the uh, slaughter would uh, take place at at the farm. That's what you're planning with the mobile slaughter. The processing may take place back at the campus. Is that right? Could take place back at the campus. It could go to another facility that they want to use. Some's going to depend on who owns the animal. Is the farmer wanting all the pro, all the produce back? Uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so there's a lot of ifs in there that we'd have to look at, but. Um, the slaughter unit and the modular units are, are all USDA certified. So the options are, are pretty wide open at that point. Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think Dave summed it up well. For us, uh, the, the mobile slaughter um, will take place off-site. Um, it, it won't take place at Ridgewater College. It will take place uh, at the farm, um, depending on, on where we get our our products from. And so um, that that's one of the key elements for us at Ridgewater to be able to start this program is that we, we won't be slaughtering animals on our campus. I had a question for Dave and Jeff. It says, how do you see the cross transferability of skills, butchering and processing to jobs in the alternative protein sector? Uh, Plant-based and cultivated meats seem to be well poised to be uh, future complements to conventional animal meat, and it makes sense that CLC and RC would uh, want to take a future-oriented approach since workforce development is such a long-term project. Is there a way that you can build pathways for your students to adopt their skill sets to these emerging technologies as well? So I, I can take a stab at that. Um, so. I, I would agree, uh, you know, plant-based is, is very much uh, a, a reality for, for the industry. Um, the, the development process of the curriculum is easy after we get our initial program developed. So once we have our initial program developed, we can spin off of that relatively easily and easily and, and quickly. Um, more so than we can to develop um, that out of the gate. So, so at Ridgewater, um, our idea is to develop, you know, the initial certificate, and then we can spin uh, additional certificates, advanced skills, uh, uh, different content related to the industry out of that more quickly than we can starting a full program. So that's why we chose at Ridgewater College to start with the basic foundations and meat cutting. And then we we fully expect to expand our our offerings in this in this um, area as long as we have the students to support that work. Yeah, yeah, great question, first of all. And I think uh, it's probably one we haven't discussed enough in our processes. I think there's two pieces. One, one is kind of a barrier is it's how much can you do in a 16 credit one semester program and can you get everything done well? I think the other piece is perhaps that's in our internship experiences that if we have students interested in those uh, plant-based, protein-based types of uh, food production, that we find them opportunities to get those experiences at those places. Uh, we could offer uh, courses, uh, for instance, we're, we are planning on offering HACCP training, which we know is necessary. Right now, folks have to go to Iowa to get that. Um, and so we're offering HACCP training for anybody that would probably be a, you know, one day Saturday or two day Saturday, Sunday type of program. And we could do the same thing with some of these specialized uh, meats and cuts and that kind of thing. But I think the question is great. And I think it's one we probably need to give more consideration to. A lot of great questions uh, about uh, the course itself uh, coming in here. And Keith and, and Michael, uh, if you feel uh, the need to add on to any of these answers, uh, just feel free to jump in. Can credits be transferred to associate or bachelor's degrees? And if so, to which programs? So at Ridgewater College, we uh, um, our, our credits would be able to transfer into our Associate of Applied Science in agribusiness. Um, we have not explored the option of transferring um, our certificate credits into bachelor's degree programs. 
um, especially in in the meat cutting area. But but currently, Ridgewater College does have strong partnerships and articulations agreements in place with uh, places like Iowa State University, uh, North Dakota State University, South Dakota State University. So um, we we do have strong relationships with our um, bachelor degree programs that are that are in our vicinity. So um, I suspect that in the future that that it would be a, a real possibility that these credits would articulate into a bachelor's degree program. We have not focused on articulated agreements at this point. However, we have been working with the U of M meat science uh, department in writing our curriculum. Uh, so my hope would be down the road that there would be a direct connection there. But to be quite honest, what we have heard is that the workforce need is now. Uh, we need to get people trained and out into the workforce as quick as possible without it being uh, a compromised program. Uh, so we're trying to give a really good training program, but also get people into the workforce as soon as possible. And then I, I, we got to get that done first. And then we can look at what are, what are the possibilities beyond that? And what are the articulations that can happen beyond that? And Jeff, uh, you talked about your uh, three certificate programs. Can you mix and match those certificates? Uh, for example, if I wanted just one and three, or if I wanted uh, two and one, or uh, is yep. there a way to mix them? Yep. So um, the, the certificates are are not dependent on one another. So, so a person can enter at, at any point and take whichever options uh, meet their needs and where they are in their, in their career interest or their uh, career experience. So um, as, as we mentioned, you could take the first certificate, uh, get the basic meat, uh, uh, basic meat cutting certificate, and then jump into the third certificate and, and do the, the meat cutting entrepreneur certificate and, and bypass the second certificate and still uh, earn a diploma at Ridgewater. Let's go to uh, class size. Uh, what is your anticipated or projected enrollment in each class? And uh, uh, Jeff, we'll, since you had the mic, we'll let you start. Well, I, ideally, uh, you know, we, we would want to start somewhere between 20 and 24. Um, the, the reality is um, successful startup for this. If, if we could get 10 students to, to start up in our first cohort, I would call that a success. Um, I, I want to keep our, keep our numbers somewhere around 20 to, to 25 per year in, in, in the cohort. Not much different here. Um, we would hope year one we'd be around 10 students uh, and grow to possibly 20, I think, capacity uh, to provide the training and the hands-on uh, support beyond 20 would be difficult without creating more space uh, for, the, for that classroom experience and a hands-on experience. So 10 to 20, we'd be sitting in a pretty good spot. Dave, we'll go to you first on this next one. Can you speak more about the apprenticeship industry and internship model and how they will be helping students land jobs in the workforce? Sure, I think there's a couple of pieces. One is we are uh, in the process of piloting in a learn and earn program at JEP. I think you referred to something similar at Ridgewater um, where students can receive a scholarship from a company. So say for instance, Thiel and Meat says they're willing to bring an intern into their their company, they'll provide a thousand dollar scholarship uh, for the year to help towards expenses. And then they will also provide them a job while they're in school. The other piece of that, and I think I saw in the question is what's the flexibility. We are planning on offering our courses either in the evening or on weekends so that students could have a job during the day and then be able to take the courses. Uh, some's gonna depend on our faculty member and available, whoever we hire for that, and their availability. Uh, and then we certainly are gonna be open to and have done hybrid courses where they can do some of the lecture pieces online via Zoom. Uh, and then obviously the hands-on pieces. There's a significant part of this program has to be in person. Uh, they've gotta be experiencing it and be hands-on, but there certainly is a plan to be flexible with the programming. Jeff, anything to add on the intern? Uh, program um, internships uh, just like our our other uh, agriculture programs here at Ridgewater College um, the the internship part of it is is a huge component to this um, we we also will be offering 
uh, the internship opportunity. I, I think the thing that's a little bit unique to our other egg programs is um, we are exploring the first actual um, apprenticeship opportunity where, where a student is working in the industry and uh, they're earning they're earning a wage as a at, at maybe a local meat cutter, but they're they're not getting the theory compulsion and the animal science portion and maybe the the food safety component to it. They they would be able to attend college and and earn those uh, um, earn that content while they're earning a wage uh, working in the industry. Michael and, and Keith, I'm going to go to you for just a second here because after listening to those answers, it sounds like they're right on target for what we've learned through the different uh, pieces of uh, studies and research that we've done at AURI and at Eggcentric uh, and what the industry, and now I think we're learning what the student wants as well. Mm -hmm. Michael, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, no, I, I think the, as uh, Dave pointed out, uh, the pandemic has really highlighted uh, issues within our supply chain. And uh, I, I think the, the need has been really been a focus on industry. And, and we're seeing that at the project level uh, within AURI, uh, increased demand, uh, taking a look at either expansion and or new startups. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has also seen that uh, with their programs, their uh, equipment programs, as well as uh, increasing or expanding and transferring ownerships. So it, it, it's a, a need that uh, I think these, these programs at, at the, the state colleges is going to be able to, to fill those pipelines. Keith, it sounds like... Uh these two campuses anyway have been listening and now are trying to react appropriately. Exactly, yeah, it's uh, so appreciative as I made my earlier comments about the steps that are moving forward here, again, with legislative support and others. A couple of things I would point out, you know, from our farm business management network, nearly 3,000 farms in that, and when 19 or COVID hit, um, you know, the desiccation of the animals came without compensation and all of that unfolded. That memory is etched out there. And so as we look to the potential students, there's gonna be some advocates for this program. Secondly, I would throw out that we operate through the Centers of Excellence, a learn.grow.do platform, which is a social media platform aimed at our youth. And we can employ the promotion through that, uh, targeting that audience. And then my final comment around that is FFA has had for a number of years, a meat cutting competition and still remains our career development event. The one linkage we haven't had either myself when I wore the blue jacket just a few years ago, or as a teacher, where are the career opportunities? Well, now we've got this pathway developing. So I think we've got a captive audience within those career development event participants that happen on our campuses to link them. So I'm excited about where we can go with that. Back to the uh, two uh, uh, colleges a little bit. We talked a little bit about how many students will be admitted or that you'd like to see uh, per term. But uh, the question is, if you have more than that, how do you choose who gets to participate? Uh, is there a criteria for that? Our goal would be to add another section, create more time for another faculty member so that hopefully we can bring everybody in. Um, I say that without having the endorsement of the president and vice president, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they would be okay with more students. Um, for, for us, I, I think we would, uh, we would be in a similar um, situation where as long as we had uh, facilities and instructors, we would, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to have to add sections. I, I hope that that is a, that is a uh, problem that we have to do uh, by August 1st. I hope we have to add multiple sections. So that, that would be welcomed. Say a diverse incumbent worker is interested in a certification program to work toward opening their own business. What sort of flexibility is anticipated in course offerings in, in terms of uh, time, hybrid models, uh, I suppose time on campus? Have you thought about that that worker who wants to go into the business on their own and just needs upgraded skills? So from, uh, from Ridgewater College perspective is um, 
we're, we're starting this program as a credit-based program. Um, so our, our goal is to offer this on, you know, weekends, evenings, those kinds of things like that. We're, we're not interested in having another program from 8 to 2.30 Monday through Thursday on our, on our campus. We, we, that's, that's not going to meet the needs of the people that are enrolling in this. So um, we'll have some distance delivery. We'll have some uh, flexible options. But then the next part of this is we expect to partner with our customized training and continuing education uh, division of the college to um, deliver some of the curriculum that's very specialized, that, that maybe a, a person doesn't necessarily care so much about earning an academic credential. Um, they just need the content specific to opening a business, entrepreneurship, uh, re USDA regulatory compliance, those kinds of things. They would be able to, to pay for our based training and, and earn that certification and that experience going through a, a different division of our college. I don't know much if we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, we're planning on also offering an evening and or weekends uh, to, so that workers can have a job during the day and then get their education. Those spaces that could be done uh, online or via Zoom certainly will be available. But a lot of this program is a hands-on. When you're doing 16 credits in one semester, a lot of it's lab time. And it's a hands-on experience in which our campus is, that's basically every program we have here. Uh, that's what they are and that's what we do. Uh, and so it would fit right into what we do in Staples with all of our other programs in diesel and heavy equipment and all those kinds of things. So uh, hopefully we can find a way to bring that incumbent worker in and find a path that helps them keep their job, earn a living, and get the education they're seeking. Will there be any training on how to navigate USDA permitting processes for a facility if I'm interested in starting up a small uh, business of my own and, and possibly growing it? Yes. Dave, same? Yep, same thing. Perfect. How many grant request applications have been received for the mobile unit so far? Uh, I don't believe, well, it's not closing until the 22nd, so uh, we'll know then. Uh, Dave talked about the need for workers in the industry. Uh, what can you say about the potential student interest in those programs? That's, I think that's a pretty insightful question. We know the industry has some needs. What's the potential for these kids to come forward? And I, I'm calling them kids. Maybe it'll be a, a, a 30 or younger uh, person that wants to step forward and get into the business somehow. It's the million dollar question uh, when you get right down to it. Um, we don't know. I will say in the last week, I've received interest from three different people interested in taking the program after reading an article uh, about that potential. Um, you know, does that mean they're going to end up coming to school? I don't know. Um, but I think it's going to be key. And I think there's another question below that probably connects to it. The key is going to be building partnerships. And so visiting with uh, our industry partners, visiting with UFCW, the grocers union folks, visiting with all of these different partnerships and saying, certainly, you know, we get calls all the time, Jeff, I'm sure you get them as well. Hey, we want to partner with you. What they want is they want to hire all of our students, which is great. But <laughs> what, what I always tell them is a partnership's a two-way street. We certainly are willing to let our students see the opportunities you have, but we need to have students in order for that to happen. And so we need you to help partner up. Maybe that's offering scholarships. Maybe that's having current employees, giving them incentives or opportunities to take these courses and advance and you know, earn more pay. Uh, and we've also got to work with that pay scale and make sure that getting this certificate or the certificates in Jeff's case is actually worth it for the pay they're going to get. Uh, so I, Dan, that's the million dollar question. And it's the one that I know Jeff had brought up earlier. It's the biggest worry right now is we know the need for the program exists beyond the shadow of a doubt. It's been proven over and over and over again. But can we find the students to actually fill that need? And do we only have seven programs in North America because there aren't students for it? Or is it just because it's not a program that's been emphasized or we've seen the need as much as we see now? I don't know. So from, from uh, my vantage point, um, 
I agree with all of the things that Dave said and, and the thing that we're seeing not only in meat cutting, but all career and technical uh, education fields is we have to get this uh, young person exposed to the career well before the ninth grade. Um, they, at, at the point when, when somebody's uh, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, either they've made their mind up on what their career is going to be, or their parents have made up their mind for them. And, and parents are a huge influence to, to students. Also, uh, K-12 educators are, are huge influencers to students. So if we can get uh, the, the opportunity for students to experience this at, a, at an early age in the, in the K-12 system, um, that that's going to be one of our one of our um, strategies to get students. I think the other uh, person that that might be interested in enrolling this in in this is early on. It's going to be probably the hobby or the enthusiast. Maybe that has somebody that has some experience in processing some some game animals, some deer, and things like that, and. They they've really they're really passionate about it. They like experimenting with the sausage and and the smoking aspects of it. Um, those those kinds of people. And then and then our our first marketing effort is going to be to our current agriculture students, maybe that have some some cattle at home, a, a steer or two that they want to you know butcher and do some direct marketing to uh, uh, to, to local folks. Um, I, I think those are going to be our three audiences in, in our marketing efforts. And I, I don't think I'm sharing any any trade secrets with CLC. I think they, they probably have the same uh, same thought process on that. But I that that is our, our nervousness is how do we uh, make this career field attractive uh, for somebody that that they, they don't understand where me comes from. And Keith, I might come back to you for a follow-up on all of that. I mean, this is, as we talk about standing up a new program in a two-year college system, what methods are used to make sure the students are, are you, you can turn their heads? Right. And I appreciate that question. Certainly, as we look to where we're at in the 712 sector, right, of AF&R, agriculture, food, and natural resources, we know we have 35,000 students in there. It goes back to Jeff's question, what's the exposure? So at to date, really, there hasn't been that pathway, as I alluded to earlier. So if I'm interested in me, me cutting at a FFA level, where can I go with that? And so now we've got an opportunity to make those connections. We're certainly going to look at our eccentric trailer, technology trailer. What's a module we can put in there that can bring about that message? And not necessarily those that come from rural Minnesota, but we look at now Minneapolis and St. Paul adding programs and there's going to be interest out of there. So how do we make these connections work for all of that? Um, but that's, as I talked about earlier, you know, I'm excited to where we're at with this phase and getting this initiation. Now it's that next phase. How do we populate with students? And not just for next August, but ongoing over the next two to five years or longer to really curb the industry demand. Well, part of that population may come from the wage potential. Uh, that's our next mm -hmm. question. What, uh, what current wage potential is there if this is a... Uh, if I want to uh, become a processor, uh, Jeff or Dave, have we done any research on potential income for these students? Yeah, we have. And it's, it's, it's a little bit all over the map, depending on whether you're working in an independent butcher shop, you work in grocery store. What our grocery store partners have told us is if they come in with a certificate, they're going to start out more than likely at that $17 to $20 an hour, and they're going to be able to move up quicker and into a management position. Uh, the example we were given is that within a few years, you could be in a $75,000 a year job. Uh, if you, Obviously, if you're doing your work well and you know there's those other components that come into play. Uh, if you're an independent person, kind of depends on your overhead and all those kinds of pieces that come into play. But what we're hearing is that there is a chance to earn a, a good living at this position. Uh, it's hard work. I mean, there's no questions that this isn't uh, this isn't cupcake work. This is this is hard work on your feet stuff. But it sounds like uh, those wages have gone up and have become competitive uh, with other markets that are similar. Uh, but we know that's an important piece. Like I said before, I think if I'm going to invest into a semester of courses or three certificates of courses. 
I got to know that I'm going to get that that out of it when I'm done. Jeff, anything to add there? Oh, uh, same, uh, same research that Dave has. Yeah, one more question, and then I'm going to go around the horn and let everybody kind of have a final say here. So uh, uh, have you given thought to partnering? Uh, well, maybe we have two questions. Have you given thought to partnering with uh, butcher shops in greater Minnesota to deliver some of that education piece? I think you both maybe mentioned that a little bit uh, earlier. Yeah, so from Ridgewater perspective is, uh, you know, because we don't have the facilities on our campus specifically, um, that is going to be our go-to facility uh, for housing this, this program. Uh, our goal is to house within a local butcher shop or facility that's already permitted and regulated and is comfortable for, for an instructor and those kinds of things. They already are equipped with all of the saws and the equipment and things like that to see if we can build some momentum. And once we know if we can build some momentum, then uh, we, can, we can look at other options like CLC and their, and their mobile units. Um, that's that's going to be our go-to early on in this program. Yeah, we actually have two or we have, I think, three uh, folks that are in the industry that are on our advisory board that we've already built those relationships with and are willing to partner with us, excited to partner with us and provide our students opportunities. Uh, we're certainly going to be reaching out even more regionally as we get this off the ground. Uh, but that is absolutely a key part of what we do is really connecting with our industry partners, our businesses in the region, because they're the folks we're trying to train people for and really trying to help them uh, in this process. And uh, Dave and, and uh, Jeff, uh, if you would both put your email address in the chat box before you leave today, there are people that are looking for a contact point. So uh, uh, that would be helpful for us. Uh, we do have just a comment here that the Muslim population will be interested. Michael Sparby, I think we saw that in, in some of the uh, 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 studies that we've had done as well. Yeah, that information uh, is uh, identified in the Halal Kosher uh, Meat Market Assessment, which is on our website, um, and a very good document of areas of opportunity in those markets. And then uh, finally, uh, a question about uh, the Meat Processors Association or the meat industry itself and what they have done to offer insurance or benefits to their employees. Uh, is, it, is there much information on that? I've not heard anything on that end. Very good. Let's go around the horn, Michael. I'll start with you and uh, then we'll go to Keith and then we'll let our uh, two uh, college uh, uh, reps uh, say a little bit. Uh, Mike, wh what do you want to leave them with today, Michael Sparby? Well, again, kind of hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we will have information uh, on a new meat innovation specialist. Uh, the cooperative agreement with USDA Ag Marketing Service uh, will be reaching out to collaborators uh, in the coming, coming weeks, coming months, as that effort moves forward to assess the, the needs of, of the meat industry across the region. And finally, the mobile slaughter unit request for proposal deadline is uh, October 22nd at 4.30 p.m. and uh, in Dan's email box. So if you have questions uh, pertaining to that, again, auri.org. Thanks, Michael. Keith Olander. Two quick comments. First of all, very exciting what we've got here, right? Because we've got this first leg of the race down. We've got programs coming on board. So for, as a webinar watcher, participant, how, how can you help? There's going to be content shared digitally, Facebook, Instagram, however. How can you help? Click on it and share it get the message out as that comes about either through AgCentric or Ridgewater or CLC, but that can be your part. But however it is that we can get students in these programs, that's one thing we can collectively work on and agree to. Jeff Miller, final word from Ridgewater today. Uh, I just wanna say thank you all for your engagement and the opportunity for us to develop a program of this, of this caliber. We're really excited to get this going. It'll be a a unique opportunity for Minnesota State, uh, Ridgewater College, and Central Lake. So thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. And Dave Endicott, we'll finish with you at CLC. Well, first of all, the energy behind this is incredible, uh, both statewide, nationwide. 
Uh, we felt it thanks to all those that have let us know of that need and for the partners that have helped us get to this point. We look forward to moving forward. And that concludes AURI Connects webinar Wednesday for today. We wanna to thank our presenters and our panelists. AURI Connects webinar Wednesday is presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. We are interested in your feedback, so please respond when we send you our event evaluations. Remember, for more information on today's program or any of the work that AURI is involved in, you can go to auri.org. Now, next month on November 10th, AURI Connects will explore opportunities that exist to make renewable natural gas, or RNG, an increasingly important part of the Minnesota renewable energy landscape. The agriculture and processing industries can play a vital role in this emerging RNG sector. So join AURI Connects webinar Wednesday, November 10th, to learn ways to better evaluate opportunities in this new and exciting yet fragmented sector. Attendees will learn about policy actions and the role of utilities to bring renewable natural gas to consumers, followed by a broad and introductory overview of the anaerobic digestion process, the main technology that's being used to convert organic feedstock and waste into RNG. And you can always learn more about other work that AURI is involved with by going online to auri.org. We're looking forward to having you join us again November 10th for another AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday.